We're going to talk about evangelism. And my name is Guy. I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach. I'm using my overhead because there's a reason. They say the average person can speak 3,000 words an hour. I've got about 20 minutes. Okay? So I'm using these pictures which speak a thousand words. Okay? So I've got about three and a half hours here. But I think I can get it in 20 minutes by using pictures. Okay? Anyway, we did some door knocking last week. We had a group come up. It was fantastic. People from all over, I mean, Iowa and Texas and Mexico, they came up to help us. And that was great. We got to meet some new Christian friends and make some uh, memories. And we went door knocking. We passed out a thousand flyers and information packets to this community. That's a thousand people out there that know about this congregation now, that know about our Lord's Church, if they read it, of course. Let's hope they did, but we need to keep that in our prayers. One of the things we found out was, if we took the kids with us, the people were more apt to open the doors for us. Isn't that something? Didn't Jesus say something about, let the little children come unto me, and unless you become like these, you won't enter into the kingdom? Something to think about. But we all at one time have had our door knocked on. Revelation. 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will dine with him, and he with me. Can you imagine what that would be like? What would you have for Jesus to eat at your house? Would you open the door? Would you be intimidated? Would you be like the song we just sang, I am looking forward to talking with you and sitting down with you. We did a lot of walking, a lot of walking, and some of it was in sunshine, some of it was in rain, and sometimes they didn't open the doors. I don't really know why, but we had a lot of fun. We did. We really did. We got to know each other. And so, think about this. For you to be here today, somebody evangelized you. Somebody showed you enough care and attention, or force, to get you here so that you could hear the gospel, so that you could sing <coughs> praises to God, so you could sing to one another and encourage one another. Somebody has evangelized you. That word, as a noun, the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. Okay, but Look at it as a verb. To convert or to seek to convert someone to Christianity. Synonyms, convert, proselytize, redeem, save, recruit. Okay, these are all ideas of evangelism. Uh, act as a missionary, missionize, crusade, campaign. Preach the Christian gospel, and they use it in a sentence like they always do. The church's mission, my word added here, is to evangelize and declare the faith. And that's what we need to do as Christians. Paul warned, reminded, and exhorted the Ephesian brother. He said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And we know who that is. That's Satan. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We struggle. We struggle even as Christians we struggle. We live in that world. We're not to be of that world, but we do live in it. And we're influenced. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. And pay attention to this next little piece. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's another important phrase. In Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace 
in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. There's that phrase again. Through faith. There's only one thing that allows God to give us His grace. And that's our faith. We must have it. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Now, I've been in the church 40 some odd years. And I've heard arguments from people that are in denominations, from people that aren't even Christians, from even members of our own church, of our own community here. Not here, but the other churches I've attended. And they're confused about this grace and works thing. Well, if we just say grace all the time, well, they're going to think we're one of them. But And yet we work, and, and sometimes they misinterpret that as earning our way to heaven, and sometimes we might portray that. Sometimes we might say, you know, i got to go to church today because i got to. I've got to teach a class today because i got to. Or I've got to... <clears throat> and I say that because I have said that in the past. And I realize when I say that, what that tells other people around me. Oh, why do you got to? Why do you have to go do these things? Do you feel like if you don't, you won't go to heaven? Well, how do I feel about that? Paul explains how we should feel about that. The next verse. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's why we do these things. And which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So it's not an either or. It's a because of. And so when we really understand salvation. And we understand that God saved us for a purpose. Then the work is, is like that old saying, if you ever get a job or it's not work, or you, or you like what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life. That's what we're doing. We're, we're not working in labor. We're working in love. And that helps a great deal. We become God's new tools. And I'm a woodworker. I know Daniel's a, a tech geek. You know, uh, and some of you others do other things, and, and I love to get new tools and get in my shop and play with them and see what I can make. <laughs> and yet, those tools, I, I can't blame those tools if what I make turns out bad. Kind of like when I was in high school in shop class. No matter what I made, if it didn't turn out quite right, all I had to do was put two grooves in it, and it became an ice tray for my mom. <laughs> and that's sometimes kind of how we look at life. We, we try, and we might mess up a little, but we're the tools. We can't put that burden on ourselves. If we're working for God, God is using us the way He sees fit. The only way we're going to mess up is if we start saying, well, God, I don't think it should go that way. I think it should go this way. And then God sits back and says, well, I'll try it. You know that saying, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> because God knows what we need to do. And he made us to do those things. Now we need to get in tune with God. Now some of you like new cars. And you know there's that new car smell that really kind of <clears throat> turns you on and think, oh, I can go faster, I can go farther, I can impress my friends, I can do these things. They're even now making a spray that you can spray in your car no matter what you have to make it smell like a new car, just to bring back those memories of maybe when you had a new car. So if you're fixing up old Betsy out in the backyard, you can <laughs> squirt it a couple times and oh, it takes you back. <coughs> we need to have that new car smell to God. We need to be ready. We need to be working for Him and able to, to it says several times throughout the Bible that we are a fragrant aroma to God when we're doing what he wants us to do. Look at Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their 
behalf. You know what this is? This is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is what we live for. This is why we live. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Well, that's a silly statement. Of course we do. I mean, I recognize Josh. I recognize Gary. I rec just from, but that's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is we don't look at somebody and say, ah, eh, he's not going to heaven, or she's not going to heaven. That's not what we do anymore. Have you ever been judged by the world? Or have you ever went to talk to someone in the world? They go, oh, you're judging me. <laughs> I'm just telling it like it is. This is what's judging you, not me. And so we don't recognize people like that, but what we do is even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him in this way no longer, he no longer walked amongst them. He was there. They ate with him. They dined. They sang with him. They prayed with him. They knew Jesus on a personal level back in the first century. Now these Corinthians may not have, but Paul did. Paul got to know him kind of personally on the road to Damascus, was it? You know, and, and he saw the light and talked to Jesus. He got to know him on a personal level. But therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Remember that new tool concept. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry. Did you know you're all ministers? You have a ministry. And that ministry is one of reconciliation. When we go talk to our neighbors, our family members, people at work, school, wherever we're at, this is our ministry, to reconcile, help them to reconcile to God. That's what we do. And if you believe you're reconciled to God, which I hope you do, then you can share that, and that's our ministry. Jonathan, thank you for reading the, the, what we call the Great Commission. Now, I don't know why we call it the Great Commission. Somebody came up with that term, maybe just to make themselves feel better. I'm not sure why. But let's start back couple of verses from what Josh read, and uh, John read, I'm sorry. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Now remember, this is after Jesus died, was buried, and raised. And the, the disciples, he calls them disciples here, they hadn't received their apostleship yet. Now the word apostle just means messenger, but they became the original messengers for the church. So anyway, they're supposed to go to this place. Now Jesus is dead. I mean, Jesus has been buried. He's risen. And he told them that he was going to do this. But they go and they meet and they see Jesus. When they saw him, can you put yourself in that place for just a second? You walked with this man for three years on the earth. And now you see him in a resurrected form. They worshipped him. That word worship, proskuneo, the root word is like your dog coming to lick your hand because it's so happy to see you. It realizes you give it its food, you give it its play, you give it its shelter. It appreciates you and it licks your hand because of it. That's the root of that. And they realized he is the son of God. And they worshipped him. But... Some were doubtful. Have you ever come to church doubtful about your Christian life? Where am I going? What am I doing? What does God want me to do? I have doubts. I have fears. Some of these men who walked with Jesus for three years and saw him resurrected were doubtful. So don't be hard on yourselves. But think it through. Anyway... Jesus came up and spoke to them, and he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But, I had another little verse down there on the corner. Did you see it? It says, 
this one. This one worries me a little bit. James says in uh, 4.13, Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Have you ever made plans for your life? It's not wrong to do. But if you do it in the wrong context, it is. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. So can you tie up your life for a second? <laughs> that is your life. It was a vapor. It is a vapor. I saw a really neat illustration. I, I wanted to do it here, but I couldn't afford the rope. The rope went down from the pulpit through and wound all through the, the pews and out the door and down the street. And the guy held up the end, and that much of the tip was painted red. And he said, this is your life on earth. That's eternity. Why do we spend so much time and money making this red part important? When that's what's coming. Something to think about. Sometimes we put ourselves as the most important being on this planet, when it should be the other way around. The creator is the most important person. So, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So it's not wrong to plan. We have layaways, we have retirement, we have vacation, we have jobs, we have college, we have all these things we have to plan for. And that's right. But don't go into it with the thought of, I'm doing this. If God wills it, if God helps you through it, you will get through it. Or maybe something will happen and you won't get through it. You won't be able to do it, I should say. Because maybe God doesn't want you to. And if you're living for God, you need to follow those inclinations. But therefore, oh, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance. <coughs> and all such boasting is evil. That's what's wrong with that, planning without God. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is a sin. The apostles were told to evangelize. They were told to baptize. They were told to go. They were told to teach. And in that is the aorist tense in Greek, which means to continue. So, they were told to teach. And then those people will be told to teach. And then those people will be told to teach and to baptize and to go. See, it's not just the apostles that were told to do that. It's us too. We were given that commission, that charge. But some people get a little, and we talked a little bit about it in class this morning, get a little confused. The go therefore in the Greek really means therefore having gone. In other words, where you are. You have gone to. And so that's where you need to start. Your family. Your neighborhood. Your city. Maybe your state. Your nation. And you spread out from there. Now, it's, now there's nothing wrong with going to India or South Africa or wherever to evangelize. There's nothing wrong with that at all. If you're inclined to do that. And if you say, if it's God's will... I can do that. And yes, you can. And many do. But start at home with your children, your wife, your husband. Start at home. That's where we need to start. In Peter's sermon, picture the scene. Thousands, anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 Jews and proselyte Greeks and that were at Jerusalem for the Passover. <coughs> and they came there to worship God, to learn about God, to see one another. I guess you could kind of equate it to some of our thing, like the Pepperdine Lectures or the Tulsa Workshop or the Faith Builders Workshop or some, something like that where a lot of Christians come together to enjoy worshiping God and to sing and all that, okay? That's what this was. This was kind of the cream of the crop of the Jews. Those that remained faithful to God's laws were following it, and they were there. And then Peter and the eleven, in other words, the twelve apostles, this is where they really earned their apostleship, 
they started preaching. And the, mir the miraculous thing about it was a lot of these people spoke different languages. And so these guys spread out, and to each group, in their different language, they would speak in that language, even though they didn't know it, through God's miracle. And all of them spoke this sermon. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attacked, attested I'm sorry, to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. Now that word agony refers to a pregnancy. That's the picture that the Greeks would get when this word was spoken. And you know how painful pregnancies can be. I've heard that they're, I'm not a woman, so I can't tell you what a woman's perspective, but I've heard they're almost as bad as when a man has a cold. <laughs> <laughs> so they're really bad. And yeah, and of course that's sarcasm for those of you that don't know me. <laughs> okay? But the idea is you know, when it comes to death, a lot of people are afraid of that other side. They're afraid of the dark. And they don't know about it. And it causes stress. It causes worry. They use the words sorrow and travail. Uh, God took that away when Jesus died because he was risen. And if we truly believe in that, it's going to happen for us too. And so don't worry about the death. And yes, it's going to be painful. It could be painful. It could be just a split second. I like the saying that I hope I, I die like my grandfather who died in his sleep and not screaming and shouting like the other people in his car. <laughs> okay? Death can, can be different for all of us. Sometimes it's not going to be real comfortable. Other times it may just be bing, and you're gone. But it's nothing to worry about for the other side. God help us if we have to suffer. And God will help us. But don't worry about that. Because you'll get through it. And you come out better on the other side. So therefore, let all... Uh, yeah, it was impossible for him to, to, to be held in death's power. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, you're a, a pious Jew. You are a person that is following God's will. And you've just been told to kill this son. And you start thinking about that. How does that make you feel? Down in uh, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, that must not be right. Because I'm sure they just accepted Jesus into their hearts. And they might have said a sinner's prayer. It doesn't say that, does it? People, if you know people like that, show them this text. It, it's, it's nothing that we're judging anybody by. But this is what the first century Christians, to be were told. And... <coughs> You will receive the gift, remember that gift part we talked about earlier, of the Holy Spirit. What did, what did Jesus call the Holy Spirit? Comforter. I will send you the comforter. And he will remind you of the things that I have said, talking to the apostles. But as a comforter, I know I've got one on my bed. When I get in there, it comforts me. It makes me warm and fuzzy and I feel safe. Imagine what the Holy Spirit can do for us if we let Him. He's already up in heaven interceding for us when we pray. He's interpreting our prayers because sometimes we don't even know how to say it. And He's telling Christ, our attorney, sitting before God on the throne, saying, yeah, I know this guy, Gilbert fella. He's okay. What's that Holy Spirit? Oh, 
he really means this. He really means he's sorry. Okay. Father, he's one of mine. It's okay. That's the scene. That's what happens when we become baptized. After we've repented. After we've heard the gospel. <laughs> it's very simple. And this is the gospel in a nutshell. So, with many other words, he solemnly testified and keep, kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. We can say that today. So that those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Another interesting scenario there, if you're a mathematician, you might follow this. Okay, so they received, they are baptized, then they were added. There's a progression there that people need to understand. They were continually voting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to the breaking of the bread and prayer. Exactly what the apostles were commissioned to do. And what the Christians were commissioned to do. It's that continual thing. So why were we evangelized? To be those new tools that God can use. But have we lost our new car smell? Have we become ineffective in God's toolbox? You know, God's not calling the able. He's calling the available. If you're not available, He can't use you. So you need to make yourself available. Now I heard a quote as I'm ending here. I hope it's not true. 95% of Professing Christians. Now, this is anybody that says they're a Christian. Have never led someone <coughs> to Christ. That's sad. I hope that's not true. It's a statistic, so I don't put a lot of stock into statistics. But to hear that as a Christian, it made me think. Have I ever led someone to Christ? Well, my wife was one, for instance. Her mom. <coughs> And I hope I've influenced my children. <coughs> I know Placina, she came around, but I've got three others that are kind of staggering. <coughs> so as Christians, we need to think about that. We need to think about the Great Commission, given to all for us to do. We need to be careful we don't turn it into the Great Omission. Because we're scared or we're afraid or we may <coughs> don't feel like we could do anything about it. I'm sure that there are wrenches in my toolbox and when I pick them up they go, oh no! I'm, not, I'm going to do something I can't. And my crescent wrench thinks it's a hammer. But that's okay. <laughs> as long as the master's using it, it becomes what it needs to be. Okay? And that's what we need to do. Some of us may want to be the feet, the ears, the eyes, whatever, and God may be using us in different positions in different ways. So let's think about that. We're going to sing a song now. And you know what it's for. You know that if you need prayers, you can come forward while we sing this song. And you can ask <coughs> prayer, and this whole group will pray for you. We'll even put it on Facebook, and everybody will pray for you. <laughs> but we need to understand that as a group of people, we need to go to God in prayer and go to God with our lives and say, Thy will be done. So if you need help in any way, if you need to be baptized after hearing the gospel, by all means, I we all have a baptistry back here, right? If not, we've got a big bathtub over there. So come forward while we stand and sing. <laughs>